So here we go. We're going to jump right into it this morning. We are starting a series we're calling Hope for the Holidays. And when I was doing this series, I couldn't get this out of my head. You may have remembered we did a, a series called Hope Beyond the Headlines a few years ago. You may have remembered that. And when I said this series name to myself, all I could think of was Hope for And I want to put in parentheses and beyond the holidays because maybe you've came in here this morning and uh, hope for you is during the holiday season. It's it's the only time you cling to. It's that Christmas feeling. Or maybe for you, uh, this time of year is the hardest. It's the hardest to cling to hope. Maybe something uh, traumatic or tragic has happened and, and maybe there has been loss. And this season brings all of that to the forefront. And what I would love this series to be is a series that would impact you, not during just this season, but throughout your entire year. And so this is what we're going to do. We're jumping into Luke chapter 1, but i gotta, I got to give a little context here, but you can go ahead and turn there, but it's Luke chapter 1, the very beginning. And uh, this is, uh, I would call, this is what our, our, our subtitle is going to be this morning. And, and each week we'll have a different one, but the subtitle this morning is The God who knows when to speak up. So if you're writing, taking notes, it's hope for and beyond the headlines, the God who knows when to speak up, which of course is a great title for this message because when we jump into Luke, it has now been over 400 years since God has spoken. Uh, Malachi was written in the Old Testament and from Malachi now into the New Testament is over 400 years. They call it the intertestamental uh, period or the, the silent years. And uh, when God speaks up, he surely does speak up because it is the announcement of Uh, his son of Jesus, that he will come to change and save the world. But what is interesting in this story is that this announcement gets interrupted by another announcement. And if you know anything about this, it's it's John the Baptist. It's uh, it was supposed to be about Jesus. And yet this story gets interrupted by another baby, John the Baptist. And I say interrupted because I, I truly do mean that. When I look at the life of John the Baptist, All that I can think of every time I see his life is it seems as if he is a distraction from the life, birth, and ministry of Jesus. Every time I read it, since I was a kid, I was always wondering, like, what's the point of John the Baptist? What what is he doing here? And in fact, when I wrote this message, I wrote another message, and uh, I'm going to call it, but I'm not going to do it today. Not two messages today. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, But what I'm going to call it was, uh, get out of the way, John. That's what I'm going to call it. But that's not today. Uh, That's another day. But uh, I I will say this about John. John's main purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus. And uh, to make it easy to understand, it's it's, it's essentially this. If you've ever gone to a concert for for a large band, there will always be, what, a cover artist who will come, and they will be the opening act for that morning. And uh, and their job is basically this, to get uh, the, the crowd ready for the main Band. That, that is essentially their purpose. And that is John's purpose, is to prepare the way for Jesus. If that is what John has called to do, I would say that John, the Baptist, is you and, it, and it's me. Because we are called to prepare the way for Jesus. It, it, we cannot save anyone, just like John the Baptist couldn't. But, but we are called to prepare the hearts and minds of those around us and, and make it a, a place that they could receive Jesus. God is so gracious that he lets you in on his saving work. So when I look at John, sometimes I wonder what the point is of John. It is God being so gracious to allow John and his story even to interrupt his announcement of Jesus. So that's where we are. And I I also want to say this because it's the first week. We are in a book called Luke, and Luke was written by a real person, a real man, an intellectual person, someone who, who wants the truth, who seeks out truth. And to put it in our own context today, essentially Luke was hired by a very wealthy uh, media uh, program that wanted to uh, send Luke out to get the, uh, the figure out the, these reports that they were hearing about Jesus. So Luke is written after the fact, after Jesus' life. And Luke now is a reporter going and finding the stories of Jesus, interviewing people, and putting these stories in an order that we could understand. He also writes a second part called Acts. And so Luke now is the how, what, when, why, if you will, of, of Jesus' life. And Acts is how, or, or how should we respond to Luke and as a church collectively. So that's, that's a lot of context there. But all that to say, uh, this is how 
Luke decides to open up this story. I think that's important. So here we go. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1. I've got a lot of reading today. So if you didn't get your Bible reading it today, we're going to do it today. All right. So uh, here we go. We got a, we got a lot. And uh, it's going to be up on the screen. I, I think it might be easier if I read directly from here, though. So it's Luke. And we're going to start on verse 5. And uh, oh, my goodness, I got to flip a page. We're going all the way to 38. Goodness gracious. Here we go. Let's read it. This is verse 5. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Habia, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing right of of the altar, the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure that this will happen? I'm a man, an old man now, and my, well, my wife is well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then he realized from gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. She says, how kind is the Lord? He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. So we're going to continue on. Interesting story to open up. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel of Nazareth uh, to a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. This sounds more like Christmas now. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed. I wanted to title this message Confused and Disturbed, but I did. Uh, confused and disturbed. Mary tried, uh, uh, tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be named Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Then the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow uh, you, so the baby will be born, will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative has been become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, But she has now conceived a son, is now in her sixth month, for the Lord of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. We could probably close in prayer right there. But we got got more to go. So uh, hope for and beyond uh, the holidays, the God who knows when to speak up. Let's pray real quick. God, we love you so much. We ask in the next uh, few minutes that we would lean into what you have to say to us, uh, that you would speak individually to each and every one of of us in this room, God, that you can do that. And uh, we love you. And um, I just want to just say right off the bat that you're for us, God. You're not against us. And uh, if anyone came in the room this morning uh, kind of questioning that, I hope today would solidify in their mind that you are forever in their corner. We love you so much. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So it was about two months ago, I, I received a letter in the mail, and I uh, began to read this letter, and as I began to read it, I began to get pretty anxious, 
and, and nervous, and uh, it was just one of those letters you hoped to never get in the mail. And uh, a couple of weeks it would pass, and I kind of knew that I had to do something about it. Um, and in fact, uh, Pastor Lincoln got, it was so similar, he had the same situation, and he told me about it uh, as I was preparing for this message, and I was like, man, why don't you tell me about it? I could have prayed for you or something, uh, but he was going through it too, and, uh, but a couple of weeks had passed, and I knew that I was going to have to do something about it, so it was about a month ago, I woke up really early, because I didn't want to like, get Jordan all worried and anxious, I didn't want to have to just get stressed out, she had to come with me or anything, so I woke up early, and um, I head out. And I arrive at the place that I had to take care of the business, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm walking in, and, it's, and I look over, and, it, and they've got, like, the name of the place, and it says, uh, Department of Motorized Vehicles. <laughs> and uh, it was the DMV. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when I got saved, I told God I'd fall into the pits of hell, but uh, not this God, you know what I mean? So I'm walking in and uh, to the gates of hell, I mean the DMV, and uh, I walk in, you, know, you guys are all thrown off now, but I walk in and uh, I look to my left, I got there really early, I look to my left and there is a, uh, just a, a really long line, it's, it's, it's actually snaked through one of, one of those lines so it looks smaller than it actually is, and uh, it had come all the way up to the door. So I literally walk in and I kind of do one of these. And I look and I said, it could be worse. I literally said that in my head. I said, it could be worse. Immediately when I said that, a lady says to me, sir, and I look over and she's going to her left, my right, and uh, she's pointing and uh, I said, uh, you can throw it, but she's pointing and, and she sends me uh, to the back of the line. I was in the middle of the line, ladies and gentlemen. The line was only stopped at the door, okay? So I had to go back and I tried to get a better picture of this. I didn't know I was going to share it. I just knew that like I had to take a picture. I was trying to get a panoramic because you can't see how far back I am and how far it curls over. I'm literally at the other side of the building wrapped around and it's snake lines there. I'm trying to take a picture and if you can see there's a security guard there, she literally says the same thing over to me as I'm taking the picture. She was like, sir, sir, like trying to get my phone to take away. And I literally wanted to say to her, I was like, what are you going to do? Throw me in the back of the line. So, but, but I didn't say that, but I'm in this line. Okay. I am not having a good day. All right. We have not started this day off right. And, uh, what I observe in the DMV is really, uh, I think it's like uh, life, okay, humanity. Um, but I observed a few things. One of the comical things I observed was uh, as people would walk into the DMV, they would literally walk in, and it was, it, was, it was perfect. I mean, everyone was laughing. They were in on this. They would walk in, remember, to the right, and they would look, and they would look to the right, and they would go, and walk out. No joke. This happened, this happened at least 10 times. No, no exaggeration. People would walk in and, uh, and literally, some people would walk in. One person literally went like this. This like so quick. There was an older uh, black lady and she walked in and she came in. She goes, not today. And she walked out. She had like a little cane. It was hilarious. Uh, but I saw that. As I got closer to the line, uh, things got a little bit more intense, a little bit more real. I began to hear things like this. People would say this to the, the, the clerk the, at the counter. They would say something to the effect of, uh, my social security number? I don't know my social security number. Uh, my, maid, my mother's maiden name? I don't know what that is. Um, uh, I needed my birth certificate today. I didn't know that. $50? I don't have $50. Oh, literally, everyone is saying this. Now, as people are saying this, everyone in the line is staring at these individuals, okay? As soon as they would say something to this and realize that the person they were talking to at the DMV was a shell of a human being, okay, and would not communicate back to them, they would literally look back at the line of people and, and, and almost as like as assistants, like trying to find hope, okay? And, and they would look back and immediately when they would do this, everyone would go, you're on your own, you're in the DMV, yeah. This is crazy. This, it gets worse. It gets worse. I'm in the DMV line. This is what I realize. I'm in this massive line, and I realize something to myself. I realize I'm in a line waiting for another line because you're, you're in a line waiting for the, the you know what I mean? And, 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 I, and I thought to myself, too, I was going to get my driver's license renewed, so I am actually in a line waiting for another line because I'm going to have to get another line to get my picture taken. I'm in a line, in a line, in a line. This is inception, okay? It, what's real? I don't know, okay? As soon as I walk out of this line, I'm just in another line. It's the DMV, okay? All right, so I finally... I finally get my number, okay, and uh, I, I, it was, it was, uh, I wrote this up, but I, I finally get my number. It was B113. I don't know how I remember this, but it was B113. So I get my number, and uh, I want to say this too. The, the, the numbers, 
They don't mean anything, by the way, all right? I just want, to, I, w- I want you to know this. They mean nothing, okay? And here's why. It's because the DMV wants the control, okay? If they, if they were actually nice human beings, they would just be one, two, three, four, and you would know your order. But no, they gotta be A156, F23, and, and it's like you don't know what's going on. It's chaos. And they're doing this because they enjoy it. It's about control, people. No joke. I was, I was waiting I was waiting in the line, and it goes, I, I, I kid you not, A110, A111, A12, F23. <laughs> they were laughing at me. They were laughing at me. So I'm holding this, and uh, it's interesting. I don't know what happened. Like, t- time doesn't, doesn't even move in the DMV, but I'm sitting there, so I have no idea. I, it's probably been at least an hour, and I'm, just, I'm hanging out there, and... Uh, it, it, it's almost like I went into another zone, another place. And just like if you're getting woken out of a dream, you know, if you've seen a movie before and it's like, hey, hey, hey we got to get out, you know what I mean? Like one of those things. I, I heard, I heard in my, in my head, it was, it was, it was B113, 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 you know what I mean? It was like one of those. And what is interesting and where I want to start us off this morning is I had become so preconditioned by my surroundings and, and, and so convinced that this was going to last forever that when my number was finally called, I almost couldn't even hear it. A lot of you know where I'm already going with this, but I had been so preconditioned by my surroundings that I couldn't hear what was going on. I want to start us off this morning and say that the DMV actually is a great representation of what I think life actually is. Let's take the line, for example. I think that life is a line in a line in a line for many of us. Think about this. This will help you understand. What happens when you have your, your three or four-year-old? You know what they say to you? If it's you know, your little girl, what will she say to you when you're like, oh, you're my princess? What will she say? She goes, I'm a big girl. You know what I mean? They'll always say this. They want to convince you I'm a big person. Why? Because they want to get to the next stage in life. They are waiting until they get to become a big person. What happens next? I can't wait till I get to middle school. So I'll be like, you know, important and big and and, and that'll happen, that that next life stage. And what happens? You're in sixth grade and you find out maybe it's not what you thought it was. But when you get to eighth grade, you'll be big and important. But what happens? You get to eighth grade and what? You can't wait till you're in high school. Because when I'm in high school, I can drive, okay? That's what you think. And then what happens? Parents, parents, what happens? What happens? That, that, that young little princess, what do they say? They're in high school, and they, they, they'll say this to you. They'll say to you, and in a moment of rage, they'll look at you, and they'll say, I can't wait to get out of this house, and I can do whatever I want. Let me tell you this, all right? I am not a parent, but I, I observe things, okay? Let me tell you the, the appropriate response to that. If they look at you and they say, I can't wait till I get out of this house and I'm free and I can do whatever I want. You know what you say to them? You look at them and you go, <laughs> and you walk away. <laughs> Confused and disturbed, that's what it'll leave them. Terrified, terrified, that's all you have to do, all right? But uh, that happens, and then for many of us, after that, things change. Uh, Maybe you go to college, and and who was your boss was your parents, but now it's the teachers and the faculty, and then uh, maybe you move on from that, and you're hoping, I'll get a job and I'll be free, but your boss was your parents, and then your boss was your teachers, but now your boss is your boss, you know what I mean? And, and, And so what you begin to say to yourself is, once I get this car paid off, or, or, or once I get this, this house paid off, or, or, or once the kids get out of school, or, or whatever it is, once we fully fund the retirement account, then what? We'll be free, right? It's always another line. It's always another thing. It's always, always out in front of you, never in reach. You know why people have midlife crisis? because they get to the middle of their life and they will begin to say things like this. I guess it's just never gonna work out for me. I guess it's never gonna happen. Or or maybe my life hasn't played out the way I thought it was going to happen. That's what happens. Of course, the the problem with this mentality that begins to develop is when good things come your way, you will be almost unable to receive them for the goodness that they are. You wanna know why? Because what will happen, we do this, I do this, what will happen is this. We'll say things like, uh, oh, man, my husband, you know, he's, he's about to get a raise, knock on wood. 
or, 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 or we'll say like, um, man, I, I, I got a lot of colleges lined up and, and I think we're gonna, I'm going to get accepted. Or, but I can't say it because I don't want to jinx it. And, and what develops in that is this maybe unconscious awareness that, that the good things in life will always be preceded by the bad things. I heard this once, and, and, and I, I don't mean to knock it, but it, it, and we're, it's a, you know, pe- preachers say this, and we say, we say crazy stuff sometimes, because um, we got to fill 30 minutes, so this is what we got to do, and, uh, but, but we got to, but, but, I, but I heard this one time, and I've heard it multiple times, and it's like, uh, and it was, it, it's meant to be uh, encouraging, and I think for some it can be, but it was, uh, it's a statement of, you, you probably, lots of people say this, um, I think I've even said this, but it's like, you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or about to go in a storm. And everybody goes, mm-hmm, amen. You know what I mean? And, and, and for you, maybe that's encouraging. For me, it is depressing. Because I'm like, when is this ever going to end? You know what I'm saying? Have you been in something before, and it's like the third time through, and you're like, is, this, is it going to end yet? Is this going to keep going on? Is this, is, is this my life? We, we, I mean, you, we almost become preconditioned to it's good now, but tomorrow, have you been, okay, all right, all right, you're in the, let, me, let me explain. You're, in the, you're at the grocery store, okay, you're in the line, you're waiting to check out. You accidentally make eye contact with someone else in the line, all right? You got to say something to them now because you're a Christian. So, so what do you say? <laughs> you're like, you're like um, the weather is so great today, isn't it? And what do they say? And they'll say this back to you. Yeah, but tomorrow's supposed to be cold, wet, and miserable. Like, oh, and if we're not careful, that can be the way we approach life. Oh, it's good now, but you wait. Oh, man, if it's, it, things, things are almost too quiet, talking about speaking up. Things are almost too quiet. Things are almost too good. What's coming? What's coming? And that's how we live our life. I, uh... I want to I wanna jump into this story just like that today. You know, it's not so much of, of what we say, it's, it's how we say it. Because the person in the line who was telling you the facts of tomorrow, was, that was just facts. It's cold. It's going to be wet. It's, not, it's probably not going to be great. That's facts. But it wasn't so much what they said, was it? It was how they said it. Which is, of course, how we jump into this story. Uh, we have a story here, and uh, if you're a, a critical thinker, if you're, if, you, if you're reading this story, you probably thought this through. That you have Mary now, and you have Zachariah. These are our two main characters, along with Gabriel the angel. And what develops here is this. Both get a, a, a sign from God. Very similar stories. Luke parallels this for us, for our benefit, to get something out of this. And, and, and what happens here is that they both get an announcement from God that they will have a child, that they will be blessed. And, and, and what you will see in this is interesting, is that they have two very, in my opinion, from face value, very similar responses to the call from God. Both seem to be questioning what's going on here, if you've noticed that. However, the both of these individuals will receive two different uh, uh, callings from the angel. One person almost is essentially left with a curse, while the other is left with a blessing. Why is it, why is it that Mary seems to be blessed by God, while Zechariah seems to be cursed. Well, why is that? Why, if they have very similar responses, they get different outcomes? I would say this, as you read the Bible, oftentimes context is, is so critical. Uh, and ultimately, when you, uh, when you question why did God do something, oftentimes uh, just, just think of it as uh, God knows the heart. We see the exterior, yet God knows the heart. And so maybe the way they responded to the question was, or the announcement was indicative of how God responded to them. But we have even further evidence in this story. And, I, and I'll demonstrate this. Mary seems to be asking how this will happen. You, you can read the story for yourself. And, and, and Mary is, is, is legitimately questioning and saying to herself, physically, how can this actually happen? I, I'm not married. I, that would be actually sinful if I were to have a child. How can this be? While on the other hand, Zechariah is not asking how this can happen. 
But he is asking for a sign that this will happen. He wants proof. Now, why is that important? And maybe you're saying to yourself right now, we just came out of Gideon and Gideon asked for signs from God. Why is it that, that Zechariah gets the, this announcement from the angel and Gideon gets something different? Let me say this. Gideon is asking for a sign, not just for himself, but for his entire nation. Because if he is wrong with this, he is leading his entire uh, nation, his family, friends, all to a slaughterhouse. So if it was me, I would want a sign from God. God, are you sure? Because I am leading these people. This isn't a question for Gideon just solely about himself. It's about what God is doing. That, that's the difference here. Furthermore, Gideon is a farmer out in the backwoods who gets an announcement from God. Zechariah is completely different. Zechariah, his life is built on ministry. He is, in, in essence, a pastor. He, this is what he, he does. His life is built on this. Interesting. He would have memorized the first five books of the Bible. He would, he would know, it would call the Torah. He would know it by heart. When he says this to the angel, when he gets the announcement from God, his immediate response would go to, and his thoughts would go to, Abraham and Sarah. Would it not? Because if you look at this story and look at his story, they are almost parallel. And he would have immediately thought of Abraham and Sarah and, and Abraham saying to God, I don't think it could happen, and God does it. And then, with all of that back context, still says, I want a sign from God. And if you're the angel, you're like, I'm an angel. This is a sign. You know what I mean? And, and, and this is where I was going to originally take this, uh, th th this passage, this verse. Uh, but I have had uh, multiple months to think and ponder on this. And I, 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 I've come to this. I, I do not think that this verse is about a man who does not have enough faith. Because I have heard that before. And ultimately, I find it lacking. And I find it missing the point. I find that there is actually more truth to this story. I find that the humanity of that is lacking. That, that, that God's response to Zechariah is not one of judgment. That's not what I see here as I begin to look at this story. Why? Okay, well, riddle me this. If Mary and Zechariah are, are paralleled beside each other, we should immediately think, that Zechariah, when he gets the announcement of a child, would be a blessing. Why? Because he, they haven't had one. It's been a long time. They're very old. It would be a blessing to him. But for Mary, this would be a curse. She's not married, okay? If she were to have a child, she would be outcast from her society, from her culture. If Zechariah has one, he will finally be in community. He will finally uh, be allowed uh, in, into inner circles. Elizabeth, what does it say about her? That her shame was taken away. That the community, that the, she would be restored. What is, what is going on here? Furthermore, Zechariah would finally have the family that he's always wanted. Mary would be questioning if she has a family. Will he leave me? Is this over? This, this would have been seen, should have been seen as a curse for Mary. And it should have been seen as a blessing for Zechariah. Why the response from Zechariah? I, uh, I, I've been thinking about this, and um, I think what I see in this story is this. It says that Elizabeth and Zechariah were very old and they did not have children. Why, why that, that detail? Why, why is it necessary? What, what's the point? Has Zechariah and Elizabeth been through this before? Have there been a few close calls? Have, have they tried multiple times to have a child and it hasn't worked out? Has there been miscarriages, stillbirths? Has Zachariah held his child in his hand and looked at what could have been? 
Has he cried out to God? Has he questioned everything? Is there, is there pain? Is bringing up this announcement not about a lack of faith, but, but about, God, I don't know if I can do this again. And if we're going to go through this, I, I, I need something because I can't do it anymore. Hey, is that you this morning? I don't know if you've personally been through that, but have you ever had a dream? Have you ever clung to something good? Have you ever hoped for something? And it just felt like it was always in front of you. You come to the end of it and you're like, this time it's going to work out. And it doesn't materialize. You thought that business was going to happen and it falls through. You thought the marriage was going to last and it ends. And you are holding on to the promises of God. And you are questioning what is going on here. And it can feel as though God is silent. That is Zachariah. That is certainly Elizabeth. And, and, and he's questioning everything. Do you know when uh, Zechariah, Zach, finally speaks up? If you know the story, you, you probably are aware of this. Uh, it'll be further on. We will not read that today. Um, but he finally speaks up. And what's interesting is when he finally gets to speak again, it's when he calls the child John. Again, why this detail? What is significant about this? Let me tell you this. When it comes to this story at the end, when, jo when Zachariah finally decides to name the child John, you know what's happening right before this? There is an argument going on. There's a debate. Uh, there's a fight. It's a conflict. Elizabeth now is having to speak for John, and she is announcing to everyone, friends, family, giving out the invitation cards uh, for the baby shower, and she is announcing the name of the child, which is John. Everyone rebukes her. Everyone says, no, we're not going to name him John. That's not, that's, no, that's not his name. And, and what, 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 what is, what is, what is, what's going on here? What's, what's the point? What's the significance? I'll tell you what it is. It's because Zachariah would have named his child Zachariah. That's what would have happened. See, you were named by your father and you would do your father's work. He would have been like his father, being in the priestly line. And, and, and that, that is the significance here. And, and so when Zachariah finally decides that the child will be named John, ooh, do you know what's happening here? Zechariah had a vision, had a dream of how things were going to be. And no doubt, maybe he has held a little Zechariah in his hands and he has cried his heart out. And what God has done for Zechariah has not cursed him. He has freed him up. See, when this happens, when tragedy strikes, when things don't materialize, you get really loud, don't you? I'm not talking out, I'm not talking this, I'm talking introverted in your head. You're always talking. Every good thing that comes your way is always, yeah, but it's gonna, it, it, this isn't, it might not, it, it could, it, everything could change. We're not promised, you know, tomorrow, so it, it, it's, it could, you know, it, it could be bad. So I guess I'll just enjoy this, whatever it is. That's the, that's the heart. And what Zechariah is doing is he's letting go of something that didn't happen. Zechariah is, sti Zechariah is still back there when he, is a, when he is met by God. He's still back in the broken dreams, still back in a past of things that didn't work out. He's still back there, isn't he? And what happens now, to be crude, is God will shut Zechariah up so God can speak up in his life. And, and what begins to happen is sometimes we get pretty loud, don't we? We let the enemy speak into our life, don't we? And you have to say sometimes, devil, not today. And God shows up in whispers. And in the thought life and in the prayer life that Zechariah would have had to develop. 
and he begins to hear the calling that yeah it was bad back there and yeah there's sin in the world and yes that was not my plan but I have something new for you today and if you begin to live back there if you set your heart and your mind back on that place you will not receive the blessing of today and so what this is is Zachariah will you let go will you step in to a new future to new plans to new hopes will you have hope or will you be preconditioned by this you know it's a painful world and, you know it's you know you're just always working hard and you, it's just never gonna happen and you're always gonna be and you want freedom that it'll never happen there'll always be something something's gonna break you know what I mean water heaters gonna go out cars gonna break you just never can save up you'll never get enough and it's just this is life I am not discounting the pain of life no 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 but in the midst of going through a storm being in a storm or about to walk in a storm I want to be reminded of the God who can calm the storm that's what my focus wants to be that's where my heart wants to be every single time I'm going it's getting tough God help me to see you that's where I want I want to be able to let go of the past I want to be able to receive what God has for me I don't want my life to be fine by what happened back there I believe in a God who is restoring and making all things new. I don't know exactly how this is going to play out for you. I don't. But I do believe in this God who has, who has committed to this. You know what's something interesting that God always does in the Bible? He's always speaking into people's lives and renaming their situations. The most famous one for me is, is Jacob. You know, who's Jacob? You know, he's in the Bible. His, his name is literally clinging to his brother's heel. It's literally what we're talking about today. It's, it's clinging on to something that will not happen for him. He will not be the firstborn. He will not get the blessing. And yet he is hoping that, that things will change. He's always clinging to the past. It will not happen. And you know what happens for, uh, for Jacob? You want to know what happens? When he finally admits to God that his name is Jacob and he accepts the past, God speaks into his life and renames him Israel after a nation and becomes a leader. But it comes to, you're gonna have to accept what happened. Yes, it was bad. Yes, it was painful. No, that was not God's plan. But I have something new for you today. I have something, I, I have life. Will you allow God to speak into you? Or will you become so loud, so negative, that you will miss this opportunity. I'm, a, I'm one of these crazy people who actually believes that God could do something like today. Like, like, like literally right now. Like a, as you are in your seat. Because sometimes we think about stuff and we're like, oh, that's a good message. I, I, I feel that. Let me go home and think about this. Let me, yeah, that, that, that I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about letting it go today. I'm saying, man, what if you, what if you could? What if you could forgive them? What if you could drop it? What if God could just free you up right now? What if you could walk into heaven right now? What if, man, what if it just, what if it just got free? Come on, I, I know that life is difficult and I know that pain happens. It's a reality. But are you gonna let the mortgage bury you? Huh? Credit card bills keep you down? Is that, is that what you're gonna do? Is that how we're gonna live? Let me take it even further. I wasn't gonna go. Let me take it further. When the announcement of cancer happens, it can be destructive. And I'm not just talking for the person who gets the word. I'm talking about the family members who are around them. Because what happens when they get the, the, the announcement of cancer? I, I'll tell you what immediately happens in my mind is it's only a matter of, if dad got it, it's only a matter of time till I get it. That's how we live. And from that moment on, we are stuck back there. We are stuck believing that nothing good can happen. It's always, it's gonna, this is how it's gonna end. Is that, is that you today? Things have happened and you're like, yeah, it's just, we're never gonna get out of this cycle. Nothing's gonna happen. Yeah, you don't understand, Pastor. It's like, we, we cannot get out of this. We are drowning in this. Jesus pulls Peter up out of the waves. You're right, you can't do anything about it. Maybe you are. But, but Jesus can. 
I, I believe in a God who can do impossible things. That's what I believe. I, that's the only hope I have. This is, this is all I have. If I don't have this, I have nothing. I, I, I'm stuck back in high school in old ways, in old thoughts, in bad relationships, doing things I hated because I believe that I was stuck. I believe that's what defined me. And Jesus showed up and said, behold, I have a new day for you. Behold, I have a new name for you. Let me say this. This is crazy. I'm getting wild. What if today, what if you, what if you even did this? What if you go to the courthouse and change your name? I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not being crazy. I'm just saying, baby, it's for you. Take it or leave it. Maybe you need a new name. People, people call me Alex. Don't call me Alex. Call me, Park, call me Parker. Parker now. Maybe you need a new name. Maybe you got to change it up. Maybe you just need to hear new life spoken into your ears. I don't know what it is for you, but I believe that God can change everything in a moment, in a moment. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it right now. So I want everybody to close their eyes. Pastor's going to come to the front of the stage and uh, I'll give three announcements. One, if you want to respond to this message, it's all going to be raised with hands. You raise your hand and pastor's going to pray for you. I won't even see it. I've got my eyes closed. It does, uh, Dustin's around here. Dustin's going to pray for you as well. Uh, Dustin, can you come up here as well? Dustin's going to pray over you. Pastor's going to pray over you. If you need a special prayer, you just come on up. Just come, let them pray for you. Second announcement, maybe, maybe you want to recommit your life today. Maybe you've walked away and, 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 and maybe you've blamed God for things that have happened. Maybe you've blamed yourself and you want a new start. Recommitment, that's the second offer. The third one is, I, I've never really committed to this. This is new to me but I feel what you're laying down and I, and I just, I think this is it. And you wanna make a commitment today and he's like, I wanna follow this Jesus guy. I want a new life. I want a brand new start. That will be the third announcement. So I'm gonna ask everybody, close your eyes. And um, this is number one. God, if, 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 if you are here today, there's an, an, anyone in this room who has been broken down by negative thoughts, by believing that the worst is yet to come, that cannot receive the goodness and the blessing from you because the devil has been so loud in their ear. And they are asking God that you would take away the noise, that if you had to, you would silence it so that they could begin to hear you. And when they spoke again, they would speak life, that it would be a new start in that area of their life. If that's you today, I'm not looking, these two guys looking, they're gonna pray for you. You raise your hand right now. You say, I want, a new, I want, I want new thoughts, a new thought pattern, a new habit, new ways of looking, new, 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 new patterns. They're, they're praying for you right now. Secondly, if you're here today and, and, and maybe you have walked away, maybe life has gotten difficult, maybe from the decisions you have made or the things that happened in your life. And, uh, it slowly happened and, and, and you don't know how, but you, you, you began to resent God. You, you began to go, uh, God, it's, uh, it didn't happen, but I guess, you know, that's life. And if, if that is your heart today and you're saying, God, I need, I need forgiveness from that. I need restoration. I want to recommit my life to you. I have walked away. I have doubted and it has affected me in every area. I want to I want to I want to start over again. I want to recommit. God, if that's if that's you today, I want you to raise your hand. These two guys are going to be praying for you right now. If that's you, you raise your hand. They're praying for you right now. Lastly, maybe you're here today. Maybe it's your first time back in church. Maybe you've been coming a few Sundays, been listening, not really sure. I'm just kind of feeling this out, hoping nobody's going to say my name. I don't really want to maybe commit to anybody, just kind of feeling this whole church thing out. But you're feeling it today, and you're like, something's got to change. I want a new start. I want a new beginning. I want what you talked about. I want a new name. I want God to speak life into me. I want, I want new things. I got I, I to gotta, I gotta drop this, but I need help. And if that's you today and you say, I want Jesus to, to come into my life, into my heart and change me, I want you to raise your hand right now, right now, right now. If that's you, first start, brand new, you raise your hand. These guys are going to be praying for you right now. I'm not looking. I'm not looking. They are praying for you. You are loved. Oh, God loves you so much. He wants, he wants the best for you. That was not his plan. Sin is awful. It is evil. But God can change in a heartbeat and turn this thing around. With every uh, eye open, yeah, you, can, you guys can uh, look back up. If you made a commitment today, 
first time, maybe recommitment, even the first one, I'm gonna encourage you at the end of the service to come and see these two guys. This is our head pastor, this is Dustin, leading worship. They're gonna pray for you. They might give some material for you, just to encourage you. If you made a commitment today for the first time, I want you to do this. This is something we always say. If you can't come up here, maybe you're a little nervous, that's okay. We're gonna do it after the service. You're not gonna do it in front of everybody this time. But, but, but I want you to do this. You need to tell somebody, somebody in your life. Tell them you started new. Maybe, maybe do a Facebook page, a post, and just say, hey, today was, was something, so I, God spoke to me today, and uh, right now, and you put the date, I'm changing everything. Maybe you put on there, I'm, forget, I, I, I'm apologizing to anyone I've ever hurt. I, I'm letting go of all the things that in my past. You put it out there. You post it. Make it public. Hold you accountable. And uh, you hold on to that. That's for you. God loves you so much. God is for you. I hope you have hope during the holidays, but I hope you have hope beyond the holidays. I hope it extends. I hope this Christmas feeling you get sometimes, you know what I'm talking about? You know that, that Christmas feeling. What if you could have that every day? Wow. That would be, that would be, that would be life changing, wouldn't it? Every day wondering, I wonder what God's going to do today other than another day. Changes your life. Changes your perspective. Can change your soul. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray for you guys. We're going to close out. Can I pray for everyone? God, we love you so much. I ask that you would be with each and every single one of these individuals, that they would walk out more encouraged, more inspired, more hopeful than they have ever been in their entire life. That they would, they would see you in a new way. They would see themselves in a new way. They would see others in a new way. God, I would ask that you would begin to speak life and truth and abundance and blessing in their life that in the situations where they have deemed and dictated that it will always be this way that you would do something new that they would hold on to this ticket that when they can't hear you they would just pray god silence me so i can hear what i can't hear make me aware god that's my hope for today you love them so much you're for everyone in this room everyone everyone in this room and everybody said, amen, amen, amen. God's good. Come down here and see pastor.